Hi, everybody. Welcome. We are going to start in a couple minutes. Jeff is present. Jeff is not just a floating map on the wall. Um, uh, so just give us a couple minutes here and we'll get started. Um, if you're having problems with the binder link, Jeff is going to address that in a, in a few minutes. So not to worry. So in the meantime, um, you can turn on captions. Um, you can uh, you can rename it your username if you need to do that. You can do that by clicking on participants and then um, clicking on the three dots after your name and and clicking rename. Um, and yeah, so we're just going to give, we're, we'll wait till 105 Eastern time. Jeff, you're back. Yep, I went to grab tea and now I am back. So <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, so while we're waiting, I like to play a game called Who's Joining Us from the Most Rural Town? So let's see who feels like they can win. I see someone on the call who maybe can win. I'm in Ancaster, Ontario. Not Jeff, you're downtown Toronto. Yeah, I'm the, at the bottom of the list, I think, on this one. <laughs> Where are people joining from? Calgary. I love Calgary. I lived in Calgary for three years. Norwich, UK. Let's look that up on the map. Mississauga, Milton. Okay, Holly's in Hamilton, but she lives in Thunder Bay. So, but I don't know if we're calling Thunder Bay rural. I think Julian might win with the outside Sudbury. Unless Holly, you live somewhere not in the urban area. So Norwich, UK is just far. I don't know if it counts as rural. Um, small town, small town, UK. Looks kind of coastal, that's cool. Um, okay, it looks like we don't have too many people joining, um, so we can start. So thanks so much everyone for being here today. My name is Ray and You've all joined as part of a GeoHealth Network event. And um, this has been a joint project funded by um, Canoe, which is a CIHR funded um, data holding organization as well as research organization um, at U of T, U of T Department of Geography, Tri-Campus Tri Graduate uh, Department of Geography has been funding this, um, the School of Cities, uh, Population Data BC, who um, hold administrative health data in BC, the University of Victoria School of Continuing Studies, who's developing a micro -creden credential in GIS. Um, that might be it. Maybe there's more. So thank you so much for being here. And we're so lucky to have Jeff, um, who I've known for a long time now. Um, and Jeff finished his PhD last year. Yeah, it was exactly. I was looking at the calendar. It's almost been exactly a year when I depended. So yes, and like, Jeff and I share. Second, so yeah, Jeff and I share a committee member. So that's how we know each other. Um, and now Jeff is the lead uh, for a visualization in the School of Cities, and Jeff has many skills um, in data science and geography, um, and has some really. Uh, cool papers on transportation and um, access. Um, but today we're going to learn from Jeff about cartography. Um, and we'll put, or I sent you Jeff's GitHub um, and Jeff has some, has a really cool car cartography style. And we were just talking before you all joined about sort of cartography as an art. Um, 
And it's all well and good. I think you can make a map and publish that, but um, it has been an interest for a few years within this group to advance our cartography style and um, yeah, as a group. Um, so Jeff, we're so grateful to have you. Um, and yeah, I'll turn it over to, to Jeff and I'm here hanging around, but um, otherwise, yeah. Thanks so much. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Um, so yeah, just thanks again for, you know, organizing this, uh, this workshop and uh, inviting me to come chat with y'all, of course. Um, I think before really, um, actually, maybe just as like a quick housekeeping thing, the way I've, we're going to do this is like, I have kind of a very shortish um, presentation, some slides, they're basically all maps and, um, talk a little bit about kind of map design generally, and uh, hopefully have a little bit, little bit of a uh, high level discussion around it. And then I have kind of three short, shortish like um, tutorials or notebooks um, about each creating a different type of map. Um, one is a bivariate map, the second is a dot map, and the third are, are flow maps. Um, and these are like, I think if you take, I've taken like an introductory GIS course, you've probably made like kind of general reference maps or, um, you know, basic core plot maps, this is going to be thought of maybe just the next step beyond that and doing it mostly through um, through Python. But before really getting started, um, I want to make sure that all of you have downloaded the material okay. Um, so I I think Ray sent you three links with Jupyter Notebooks in um, that would should open up in Binder. Um, where was everybody able to um, access those? Because binder can be a little bit slow, and I think it might lag a bit if um, they there's lots of you on it. I haven't actually used it for this large of a group. Uh, many of you are there. There's looks like I'm getting lots of thumbs up. Yeah, you just have, usually you just have to refresh, and it should be okay. Um, if you have Python on your computer, I think my suggestion would just be to download the. Um, actually, I'll, I'll open it up. The I'll just quickly share my screen, so I'll probably end up doing that anyway. Um, Everybody see my screen with the notebook? Hopefully, yes. Yes, okay, cool. Um, there is a link within it to, yeah, these are the links. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll also share the links for just, if you wanna download the files locally and open, if you have um, Python on your computer, you can run this locally as well. And that's probably good if you ever want to take any of this material and use it for anything else in the future. Um, so if, uh, these are three links to just zip files if you want to download it locally. Um, But before we really get started, I'm, I was hoping we could just do like a round table, very quickly introduce yourself. Like, I'm just kind of curious where people are coming from. I saw the studies at the beginning, but like what more of your academic background is. Um, I think most of you are graduate students, but I don't think all are. And I do recognize a couple of names on the, the call, which is nice. So um, I'm just gonna like uh, go through an order of the screen. And then maybe that person, once you've finished even introducing yourself, you can then say somebody else's name that hasn't gone yet. Um, so Priya. Hey Jeff, nice to see you again. Um, I'm actually at Canoe now, so I'm representing the Canoe team as as one of their data scientists. Oh, cool. Well, I didn't know that. Congrats on the on working over there now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess I will pick Alicia. Uh, hello. Uh, I am a second year master student at UTM, uh, looking at air pollution in Hamilton uh, and trying to get just a bit better at cartography. Cool, welcome. Uh, and I will choose uh, Candice, okay? 
Hello, everyone, and hello, Dr. Jess. And I'm Candice. I'm currently a PhD candidate in the University of Waterloo, and my study area is related to the uh, technology transition and uh, ad adoption in clean energy and transportation. So sometimes I uh, will use like uh, the GIS to do some uh, like spatial analysis and things like that. And happy to be here. And maybe turn to Samantha. Yeah, sure, yeah. My name is Samantha. I'm a second year PhD student. I'm actually in the civil engineering department. Um, I study piped water supplies and I'm pretty introductory to GIS, but I have some experience in Python. Um, maybe Namitha, you can go next. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Namitha. I'm I'm an environmental science graduate from UEA UK. Uh, I'm here to improve my cartography skills. Uh, I'll choose Marsha. Hello, my name is Marsha. I'm, uh, I'll let you guys see me. It's fine. Um, yeah, my name is Marsha. I'm a second year uh, PhD student at the University of Waterloo. My background is in uh, geography and environment. My previous degrees are in geography and environmental sciences. So yeah, I worked in the G GIS industry for a few years, but it's also been a few years since I've uh, I've, since I've worked with some of this stuff and I've never worked with QGIS before. So this is somewhat new to me. Thanks. I'm going to choose uh, Julian. Hello, I'm Julian. I am doing, I am at Laurentian University in um, interdisciplinary health and I am looking at uh, autism services, access to autism services in Northern Ontario. And I will select James. Hi everyone, um, I'm James. I'm a part-time PhD student at uh, the, uh, the School of Public Health at U of T. Um, my interest is in um, air pollution and health and uh, control of air pollution exposures. Um, and I'll choose uh, Brian. I can read out um, Brian's. So I think um, put his in the chat. Um, so Brian says, I'm a master's of science student in EPI at University of Alberta. Brian's work focuses on social and environmental exposures, primarily air pollution and psychiatric outcomes. And thank you for hosting the workshop. And Brian is throwing it over to Holly. Hi, I am a uh, research associate at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Um, and my background is in environmental studies where I did um, traditional knowledge mapping with indigenous community in Northern Ontario. Um, and then I'm also doing some mapping with in my uh, work at NOSM. And um, Willem, I nominate Willem. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Willem. Uh, I'm, it's my last day as a postdoc actually um, in the transit analytics lab. Some of you I recognize, I taught a workshop on access to opportunities a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I'm using maps a lot in my now new consulting work also, and um, Jeff's a great cartographer, so I'm here to just hang out for the first little bit while he talks about philosophy, and then I'll probably uh, drop off after we get to the Python part. Oh, uh, and I nominate Davia. Or Davia, Thank you, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Davia. Uh, nice to see you here again, Jeff. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in uh, transportation at U of, U of T. Uh, my research focuses on travel behavior and transportation and land use. I'm here to say that anything interesting about the cultural I could learn from it. Thank you. 
anyone else? Really? I think everyone has introduced that one. Oh, sorry. Here you go. <laughs> this is Mika Fraser. I'm in the dark, sorry. Um, I'm a GIS analyst at the BC Center for Disease Control. Um, I've been there for quite a few years now, um, but uh, prior to that, I was I was a geographer uh, at UVic. So I'm interested in um, web mapping a lot, um, but for a variety of public health topics that we get to deal with at the BC CDC, including overdose response and surveillance, um, environmental health as well as um you know covid whatever comes up okay um i think maybe uh alicia did i was there anyone else that i missed Fine. oh yeah uh anas yeah hi everyone uh i'm anas I'm a PhD student at Carleton University, and we do air pollution modeling mostly. And we use lots of mapping, so this is actually very useful. Thank you. Is that everybody? I think so. Although I realize that the further we go, it's hard to remember. Maybe Elnaz? Yeah, Elnaz just introduced herself in the 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 chat but um I've, I've worked with Elna's actually before in research we both had the same um, supervisor and she was a she says a PhD graduate in urban regional planning and then planner at uh, MTO so um I think is anybody else that we're missing before we really get started okay cool um let me go back and share my my screen um can you guys see some slides that are that i just kind of popped up now yeah i can see them okay cool uh i might as well make these bigger um so th this is actually kind of slides i pulled out of a guest lecture i gave to um, an, an undergrad class um uh about a month or two ago but it was it was a lecture generally just about cartography and i think uh, as I mean, this will be a lot shorter than the, the guest lecture but it's hoping this will be kind of like a jumping off point before really actually looking at some at some data um so i mean ray introduced me at the beginning but i, I guess i also want to say that i've been doing kind of um you know cartography visualization work like in some form or, or some form or another for most of my life like I mean when I was a kid like when I was like five or six years old when I would go to the beach I would be drawing like a map in the sand rather than like making sand castles and stuff so I think it kind of led to this longer term uh, career trajectory um, but in terms of an actual kind of you know work study school kind of career like it's been since about 2014 2015 since I've been actually making maps um um uh, like digitally and for and for work like as a freelance kind of cartographer um and I've been doing kind of projects like you know been part of teams for making you know larger interactive maps and dashboards to doing kind of you know smaller projects like just making been asked to make like a map that's you know very small that fits inside a book for you know for example like that and all of you know all of these different types of maps this is just like a, a few little bits and pieces of different ones um each one is obviously taking like some specific uh, design constraints and um, different data sets, or sometimes even lack thereof. Um, and now I work at the, the School of Cities, um, and the School of Cities, I guess, just briefly, uh, we're one of the, the funders for um, you know this workshop series. I think I don't know to what degree, but um, but generally, we're a center for kind of um, we're a smallish center at the University of Toronto, and but the the key part is that we're kind of a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary center for you know research, teaching, and then also community outreach on cities. And a small piece of that, which um, a lot of what I do is trying to create like interactive maps, data visualizations, project websites to take a lot of the great research that's going on at U of T and making it more accessible to a wider audience. And there's probably like a whole you know workshop that could be done in the future on making uh, web maps and interactive maps um, using like open source software and things like that. 
um, which is a lot of, I use mostly open source things. Um, but I, I thought I'd start this kind of um, workshop by asking just a very, very general question, which has many, many answers um, about what do you think makes a great map? Um, and I, I want to just not, I don't want to be the person who answers this because uh, I have my own kind of thoughts on it, but um, I'm just curious generally if um, what you guys think. So um, what do you think makes a great map? It doesn't, I like this map. This is just an example of a map I really love recently of the historical map of Toronto, but um, you know, there's lots of great maps out there. And I'm curious what your, what your thoughts on this very general question are. Yep, if you raise your hand, just go ahead and talk, I think, is it? Hi. Okay. Yep. Uh, I was just going to suggest something that is, uh, is uh, has a clear message that um, is hard to misinterpret. <laughs> yeah, so there's definitely something about, you know, the map being, I think, like, four or five of the answers in the, in the chatter is, you know, clear and being informative and clear and clarity and informative um, is definitely a big, big piece of it. Um, and I, yeah, I really like the uh, the last um, response that you know tells a story or gives a history about the area or the people living there. So I think it's um, um, that's definitely a big part of it. Whatever the story happens to be, if it's about people or wildlife or even just you know the built environment or physical geography, that's definitely a huge part of it. Um, and yeah, definitely something that's engaging too, um, which is I think you know something that's quite difficult to do at times, depending, but, um, but yeah, the best maps out there are definitely engaging. Yep. Yeah, definitely gra graphically pleasing too. I think there's certainly a kind of a, um, which is, Probably the hardest thing, in my view, when trying to design a map is, you know, some something about the aesthetics. Um, yeah, and exploring and going deeper. I love maps that, like, have a, you know, they work at multiple scales. It doesn't have to be a, with, like, a geographic scale thing where you zoom in and out, but, like, there's different layers to viewing something. Um, cool. Yeah, no, I, I love all, a lot of these responses, and it's kind of in, <laughs> in line with a lot of my own thinking. Uh, yep, you raised your hand. Marcia? Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, one of my favorite ones, like a map exhibit I went to um, in Boston, where they were having, they had a ton of, like, historic maps from a certain region, and you just got so much more than you would get just from, like, the history books, right? Like, it gave you indication of, like, what was on ships, because it was, like, during, like, a, like, the Sugar Wars or something in, uh, in the Caribbean, so it was just, like, a really interesting history mm -hmm. from Was just that in the, the old uh, the public library there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been there as well. And I, I think I think raising that's it's probably the same place, but yeah, it's this like beautiful building with love. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um cool. So the the three things I think of, I mean, which I think align a lot to what you folks were saying is um, one is about the first is always in my mind about content. Like it's the story you're trying to tell. And I mean, a story can be, you know, very broad sense of story. It doesn't always like doesn't have to be kind of a specific narrative, but yeah, whether it's about shipping or history or even kind of something very contemporary, like um, there has to be kind of a story worth telling. And that could be something very broad or something, you know, a very specific research topic, of course, as well. Um, and the second is about, you know, functionality. And I think that, you know, aligns with a lot of what you're saying initially with, um, you know, something being clear and concise, not misleading, of course, although it's, um, you know, if you present something on a map that's depending on what the data set are, I mean, people can um, think about it in different ways and have derived different meanings from it. Um, whether that's uh, depending on the context, that could be a, a good or a bad thing, but um but yeah, it's something that's, you know, functionally is able to communicate what it's trying to communicate, what the author is trying to be or creator is trying to communicate. And the, the third is, you know, I don't, I think a couple of you mentioned this, I'm, you know, generally just being pretty or graphically pleasing. Um, 
the word I, I use is elegance, but I don't really have a good definition of it. Um, but I think it's something where, you know, all the components in the map, like harmoniously fit together um, in like a very visually, you know, pleasing way, like not, one, you know, one, like, you know, this could be a combination of like how the layers fit together, color palettes, font, the selected fonts, everything kind of fits within its place um, and doesn't feel out of place. Um, So yeah, cartography is often thought of as the, or defined as the art and science of making maps. Um, which I, this is a fine definition, but um, um, when I think of cartography, like, or at least the work I've done, it's, um, I think of it as kind of like a craft and um, um, and design as well. So it al almost always has some constraints. And this can be, you know, constraints of the paper space we're working it with, like we're trying to fit it into a web page, like it has these kind of general physical constraints like that. But the data we're trying to map also has constraints, like um, of where geographic features are relative to each other. And kind of an interesting, in my mind, kind of parallel is kind of when you're thinking of just general data visualization when we're making a chart. So if we're like making a chart of like five categories and each one of those has a value, like we can think of, um, there's lots of way to represent that. We can do a bar chart, we can do a dot chart, we can do kind of a line lollipop chart. There's, or even like a you know, pie chart, like there's lots of ways to use it, you know, move the two-dimensional space on a chart to represent the same data but in a map we're bounded by the you know the x y coordinates of where things are we can work with different projections and things like that but they're you know the relativeness to each other um has a lot more um you know constraints specifically um and then it's also something where i find like you know making maps or cartography is um I was saying to Ray before this, like, it's not something that's like, can you know, doing a workshop and something like this is often very, uh, I find kind of difficult and challenging. It's not something you can just kind of like, it's not a skill you can just learn instantly. It's kind of like, I think a, the parallel is writing where it takes kind of, you know, hours and hours and years of work to really kind of build up um, um, kind of the craft and technique to um, build something or personal, I say this personally, like something that I, you know, I'm really happy with. Like it's, um, it took me at least like a couple of years of um, I think kind of taking JS courses and making my own maps on the side to like really get a style and um, feeling more confident in the work I was creating. Even now, I still don't think I'm great at it, but like I've learned a lot of kind of tips and tricks along the way. So it's um, um, you know, there's probably a lot more parallels I said to writing, but also things like you know, other kind of you know visual designs, interior design, or even things like woodworking and carpentry and architecture. I think cartography. I think more like those kind of disciplines than maybe. Um, you know, a harder like um, hard science or something that's much more in the visual art space, although it definitely takes elements of both of those. Um, so cartography often involves a lot of questions about like, you know, what features do we select to include on a map? Um, how do we journalize those features? And then how do we symbolize that data? So Google Maps is probably the map that has been viewed by the most people in human history. I can't think of something else, but, and most people that look at it don't really think about um, what why are things on the map and how are they visualized as they are? Like, I mean, it makes sense to visualize the park screen and kind of the roads have these straight lines, but um, that's kind of what the features look like in reality. But if we look at kind of any zoom in to, you know, Google Maps, like there's a lot of like, I think, little decisions that are based off of just like a big set of rules that feed into their algorithm, what data that they put on the map. Um, and these are decisions as, you know, if we're making a map for a research paper or a report or a poster or something, we make these decisions too, but doing it a lot more um, specifically in the things we're trying to create. Um, so I won't kind of dwell on this, but I think it's, um, these are kind of the main questions that we're thinking of when we're um, starting off to, to make a map. Um, and then map design, of course, is a combination of like lots of, not always, but usually a combination of one or more layers. Um, so there are maps that are just like completely univariate, just one one layer, and it's kind of um, these very kind of minimal represent representations of a feature. But um, even when we're working with GIS and you know digital maps, we're working with data in different layers. But older historical maps do this too, and fantasy maps too as well. So I mean, a middle like this map of Middle Earth is probably the most viewed fantasy map, I think. Um, maybe the ones from Game of Thrones more recently over the past ten years, but even though. That it shows lost in popularity. Those maps were also viewed a lot. But you can think of like a you know a map in this style, like each data layer, like the mountains, the forests, the rivers, they're all styled in the same way. Um, the rivers being kind of very thin or thick lines, depending on probably what their water flow are. The forest is these little trees, the mountains is these um 
shaded um, kind of pyramid shapes, but in slightly jagged form to look like mountains. But they all have kind of the same styling throughout the map and then allows you kind of, you know, very easily pick up where different, these different geographic features are. And then, of course, it has kind of reference layers like a title and a north air on things like that. Um, so move your, oh, the participant images. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was on the side. Um, no, hopefully that's a, li a little bit better. Um, and then so each layer, there's, you know, there's decisions on how each feature on the map is are visualized. So this is another same kind of topographic maps of, of that were developed, you know, 80, 100 years ago, like the one of Toronto I showed, but this is of Tobamori up in, in the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario. Um, and this is an example of like, I think a very nicely symbolized, like general reference map where there's not really one data feature we're trying to have stand out, but something where, um, you know, we can think they all kind of work together to tell us about what the, the land in the area looks like. But we can also really just look where we just want to know where the buildings are, which is not too hard to pick them out as these little black squares. Um, but at its kind of core, thinking about how we symbolize data, we can um, break it down to these, um, what are called visual variables. Um, and this is just kind of a subset of a much larger kind of matrix we can think of in terms of visualizing different types of spatial data, um, size, shape, color, uh, hue, value, kind of how saturated it is, kind of how oriented something is, um, and how they can be applied to different uh, types of vector data, which you're probably all pretty familiar with, points, lines, and areas. Um, so there's other things as well that and we can go in here in terms of transparency and stuff like that that I'll talk a little bit about. but. Um, each layer in a map can be, you know, we can can probably be um, deconstructed to something like this. I mean, these are kind of this is the classic core black map, of course, um, on on the right side here. And then there's kind of things when we're bringing these all together, we're adding data layers from multiple things um, to tell a story. And one of the the things I like to mention in terms of to think about in terms of when you're designing a map is about hierarchy. And this is about kind of emphasizing certain layers and features more or, or de-emphasizing others. So what is what is the data layer you really want to show and tell a story with? And this is kind of a very simple map of population density in Toronto that I had made for a, a, like a slide deck a while ago, but then it never ended up using for anything. But um, but the the goal of this was just to show where are people living in the city or the or the broader region and how that's related to transit, um, which are the kind of the dark, darker lines. So the core pleth layer under elite, the population density layer and the darker transit line layer were basically what I wanted to show, but wanted to have some reference data there as well. So if you can kind of see in the background, there's um, white lines for where there's kind of the, the road network and also kind of the, the thinner, lighter blue lines for kind of the municipality boundaries. Um, so wanted to have this data as a reference layer, but didn't want it to really stand out too much and take away from the other components of the map. Um, and then each one of these layers, we can also think of as, as broken down as one of these kind of visual variables, like the, the polygons are shaded based off of um, both some color value and some saturation. Oh, that's my back one, two more. Um, well, all the other data layers are kind of just as one type of um, symbol. They're not categorized based off of any value. Um, another important, I think, aspect or component to think of when designing an entire map is about kind of, it's a term that is more, I think, in graphic design, it's called balance. And it's more about the visual weight of an image. Um, and it's one thing I see a lot of um, GIS exported maps don't do a very good job in. And I'm showing this map, this is a map of public libraries and population density again in Toronto. But I'm partly showing this because this is one of, I think the very first map that I had made digitally that I actually tried to do this with. I think I would change things with this now looking back at it like eight years ago. I made this in 20, January of 2015. So it was, it was a long time ago, well, relatively long time ago. Um, but I, I tried to really work on centering the geography I was looking at, the, the within this study area here, the city of Toronto, within the overall frame of the image. And then any of the other map elements, mostly the title, the legend, North Arrow, to fit within cleanly within the extra white space of 
the the overall map to make much a much more of a overall cohesive image that um I thought looked a lot nicer than if the map had a was kind of skewed in one way or another or if the title there it's often I, I see kind of um people exporting like a, a map and then just putting the title and legend on top of part of the map area or something like that which is um or like leaving a way too much white, white space there's something I think about fitting everything in and kind of create this overall cohesive whole and um I use a lot of grid lines to do this so you can kind of see this in the background here these kind of um, grid lines that I actually added to the map to try to fit this in um and um within kind of like the more of the data visualization space but a little bit in cartography as well there's um feeling in the 80s and 90s or so there's there's a big push to make data visualization and information design to be as kind of minimal as possible and really only um show um include things on your map or you know your chart or your graphic that were actually helping tell the story of the graphic rather than not to have a you know a big border that wasn't going to do anything or um grid lines that didn't really mean anything too much um and this kind of stemmed out of uh information designer called Edward Tufty or Tufty I actually don't know that's his last name um and they're generally good guidelines to go through but I do find in cartography there are cases and I think this is one of them where it's kind of nice to have this kind of background information a, a bit of a border not always it depends on totally what, what the, the context is that maybe not um really it's not a part of data layer onto the map for example but it does provide a nice um you know overall weighting of, of the image I think um particularly these kind of grid lines in the background um that Kind of hide a little bit of that overall overall white space um and then there's a kind of a final quality in terms of an overall map design that i think is probably the most difficult to do um and i kind of touched upon this at the very beginning about the concept of you know kind of how in a very elegant or if you said in the chat more something aesthetic quality something that just really looks nice and um and i think this is achieved by all the elements or cohesiveness or unity between all the elements in the map so this is kind of be every data layer this can be the legend the um the title whatever else is included on the map and having it all fit together in a very cohesive way this is something that probably takes years and years and years of um practice and effort to really get right and it's something that i you know personally don't, i still you know struggle with a bit when i'm making maps now but um and the background here is actually is a map from the national geographic i think one of you mentioned that um where it says it's just a very zoomed in part of part of the Himalayas around Mount Everest and I found this map on the, the side of the road a couple of years ago and I was walking around and uh, um saved it and then now it's uh, framed up on my my wall somewhere um oh yeah two other things I want to kind of mention before we really get into the Python side is that one is uh, about accessible map design and so I think it's something increasingly to be um to think about when designing maps is designing particularly designing maps for people who are colorblind I think it's probably the biggest accessibility limitation with a lot of way maps are designed so this is just an example of on the left this is the London tube map which is probably the most famous transit map in the world um but this is what it looks like generally is if you were um if you were had one I forgot the name of the colorblindness that um leads to this view but there's several different types of um, color blindness maybe it probably maybe a couple of you guys know more than I do about it but this is what it would look like for one of those um one of those types um and you can see it's kind of hard to distinguish between some of the lines particularly this from what this side would be the red line and this kind of brownish orangey one and then the right here is the way a designer has tried to fix that by not just mapping by color but also Creating these different dashed lines so if somebody was colorblind and viewed the map they would be able to easily distinguish between these types while maintaining the color but also having this other um, um way to style the lines so using two different types of visual variables to distinguish the lines in the map um there's a couple of good references I mean one is called color brewer for um picking color palettes that are color colorblind friendly and there's also a couple of web tools I forget the actual names of the websites but they just allow you to take an image so let's say an image of a map that you made upload it to the website and then you can test all the different types of color blindness and then see how it looks in those different views um so I play with that sometimes if I'm going to publish a map 
Yeah, so yeah, thanks for putting in the chat, uh, Color Brewer, which is a, a good resource. It's been around for like 20 years, I think. Um, and then I also want to just briefly end with talking about designing maps to fit, that fit in specific publications. Um, and this is probably one of the biggest things I see with, as I've, you know, be, prior being working at a university and then prior being a grad student, which is something I think a lot of people don't think about or do very well, um, is to design like this, this isn't just a map, it could be just even a bar chart or something like that, is to design the figure specifically for its intended space. And so this means kind of like if you make a map in GIS or R or Python or whatever the thing is, the tool you're using, is to export it specifically for kind of the dimensions and units that um, uh, that you're fitting it in. So whether it be kind of a journal article or a report, uh, but it could also be a blog post on a website. It could be just like something you're sharing on social media. Um, each one of these have their own kind of design space for, you know, rectangle or square usually um, that it's fitting in. Um, and if it's often the case, I see somebody's created, you know, quite a nice figure that's effective, but then it's kind of either scale, then it's scaled to fit within this space. And then it ends up not looking very good or even ends up being kind of inaccessible because the, um, you know, they'll take a larger map and trigger it down to a space, smaller space. And then the font is too small for most people to read. And then you kind of have to, you know, control plus and zoom in and then the font is all fuzzy and then it's not really good viewing experience, despite the, maybe the original graphic being quite good. Um, it's also the case the other way where some, somebody might design something small and then try to zoom it up, blow it up to a bigger space or um, and then it, the map either gets dis distorted or kind of fuzzy or illegible. Um, maybe to most of you, this seems kind of like an obvious thing, but it is something that I've noticed a lot with um, particularly academic papers and um, some public reports that they don't have a kind of a designer on team. Um, it's also something as well, maybe somebody designs a really good figure for a paper or a report and then puts it onto um, like a academic poster for a conference. Um, it's cases like that where it's much better to go back to your original graphic and re-export it to a higher resolution than just kind of dragging and making it a lot bigger. Um, again, to some of you, this is probably a very obvious thing, but it's something that I still you know, see it's a, um, a mistake. Not the same mistake, but it's a, kind of something that's a very easy fix to make your work look a lot better. Um, and then the last part I think is just kind of aligning, if you have like a much larger document, like a paper or report is, Aligning, making sure your styles, colors, things like that are pretty consistent across. Um, if you have several figures or maps in your document, making them all have very similar colors or styles is, um, makes for a much nicer reading experience. Um, it makes things feel like a more cohesive document as well. Um, so that is about it I have generally on kind of overall topics. So I was wondering if anybody had a more very like general questions about cartography and map design before we start looking at some data. I was wondering what you were thinking about for hierarchy, because I feel like I approach this a lot, like this problem, I guess like what questions do you run through your head about deciding on hierarchy? Because I feel like this often comes up when I'm finalizing a map and I feel like it's not as talked about as much like in my GIS minor. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like it really matters if you sex. So I guess I was just wondering sort of what questions you ask um, to sort of help you determine this. And often I guess the part that I struggle with is you might have something that's very important uh, that you want to put at the top, but other things look quite disjointed. Like for example, these lines of transit, like if you had something very important and those lines are broken up by other things, then it seems like you've missed that continuity. And so I, I like, I don't know. Take it as you, as you can. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's not like a, it's something that I don't think. Yeah, it's mentioned is mentioned too much in kind of like a state like that. In more of a GIS course, often well, it depends on the instructor, I guess. But um, I don't think there's like you know a specific set of like rules or something to follow. I think I partly just go by feel, and I think sometimes I probably still make some mistakes and I could do things a little bit better. But I do tend to think of like what is the story or data I'm really trying to show and what is more kind of in an auxiliary or what's just kind of like a reference material to that. Um, mm -hmm. 
So it's kind of thinking, what's the hierarchy of layers in my mind? This doesn't have to be the order that they appear in like GIS, which one shows above the other. Because sometimes like a reference layer will be like a label of a town or something like that. And you want to put that above, but it would, could be just in a very kind of, you know, smallish font that doesn't really distract from the overall story. But um, yeah. And it's also, I think I find doing something where if I'm going to use color in the map, which most maps usually have color, not all, um, tend to use the colors that will stand out the most as the data for the specific data or data sets that I'm trying to tell a story for. And then everything else kind of do in the same color palette or a very muted color palette. So I've done maps where like, you know, use kind of whites to grays for more background reference stuff and then use color for the, the data sets I'm really trying to show. But um, I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but I think it's a difficult, it really depends on each individual map. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other one was, I was wondering just what you think, like, because I've heard controversies around, I just wondered what's the practice for North Arrow? Like, do we always include it? When are we not including it? Um, yeah, I think most of your maps have included it. Yeah, I, I don't, to me, it's, uh, I, I only really include it if it's not obvious. I think that's the my rule of thumb, but because this map, I have it, but that's because I rotated the map. I think it's something if north is not up on the map or like directly up, then I'll include it. Mm -hmm. And then that's probably it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. So if there aren't any other kind of general questions, I think what we'll do is actually get into the couple of the mini tutorial workshop thingies that I've put together. Um, and so I'll give you guys a, a minute or two to kind of just open it up and maybe give some uh, thumbs up in the chat or, or something like that once I think we're, we're ready to go. The first one I'm gonna talk about are bivariate maps. Um, I showed actually a, one on this slide. These were a couple of bivariate maps of transit access and immigrant settlement. But um, but uh, the uh, example I have in the, um, the workbook is a different example. Um, so does it help if everyone only has one of the three open for now? Um, I don't know if it makes a difference. I tend to just, I mean, I had these, I'm running this locally rather than on Binder because just to save the Binder's server space. I actually don't know if it matters from the Binder perspective. Um, it's a good question, but you don't need to have all three open. I'm fine just having one open and we can then close and I can we can navigate back. They're all just kind of in the same folder. So I think most of you probably have made kind of core plot maps like this, um, where these are essentially like core maps of one variable linked to um, to polygons like this, often census boundaries, but it can be health units or postal codes or lots of other things as well, of course. Um, and so bivariate maps are, you know, very, very similar, but except instead of just mapping one variable, we're mapping two variables. Um, and um, so this is the example that we have um, that we're going to try to recreate, but that we can play with the play with it a bit, of course. Um, and one of the variables variables we're mapping is material deprivation, which is kind of a 
combined metric of you know lower income, edu um, lower education, um, unemployment rates. Uh, I think maybe housing's in there as well. Um, on one side, and then on the other side is the quality of, of cycling infrastructure in, in Winnipeg. Um, so of course we can just map these two variables individually, like we can have a core plot map for each of them, but overlaying them on the, to a single map can be you know, very useful for like kind of looking at correlation, highlighting pockets where there's, um, uh, or lack of correlation in different areas. Um, so like in this map, we can, you know, pretty quickly, the dark purple areas is where there's um, higher material deprivation, but pretty good cycling infrastructure. But the pink areas are areas where there's higher material deprivation, but the cycling infrastructure is quite poor. So it could be ar argued in, you know, a transportation equity sense, this is where we should improve uh, cycling and infrastructure in, in the city. Um, and there's other areas of the kind of the, the pink and the green are kind of the if we were going to plot like a correlation of this, they would be the outlier as well. The white would be kind of low on the left and the purple would be high on the right. Um, basically in the same orientation as this, we put the like a scatter plot onto this. And sometimes we can get created by very maps with the scatter plot onto it. Um, so yeah, these maps can be, you know, very useful in kind of in terms of what telling a story of two uh, two related variables. You know, we can highlight specific areas, you know, of need in this case. Um, and they can also be just a very good exploratory tool to before actually running a model, if we wanted to run a model between these variables or even other variables. Um, so I've done like sometimes before running like a spatial model, for example, I've taken just like all my variables and created a bunch of smaller maps like this, relating like a bunch of variables to whatever depend dependent variable I was interested in. Um, so this uh, kind of tutorial will go through kind of creating basically this map, but um, the code can be basically parsed out and used for basically any aerial data where you have uh, quantitative data attached to it or, or qualitative data as well. You can make these kind of bivariate maps with categories too. Um, so using obviously Python and some GeoPandas, pandas and GeoPandas within it as well. Um, So yeah, the first code block is basically just loading the libraries we'll need. I'll talk about a little bit about them. I mean, um, have most of you worked with pandas and or geopandas before? Um, I, I think all of you have Python experience, but I think um, I'm not too sure, especially about geopandas, I'm not too sure as much. Um, I'm just wondering if I should, no one person hasn't. Yeah, so geopandas, um, so pandas is, off it, like pandas, what does that stand for? Uh, you know, Python analysis with data or something like that. I should actually know that, but I don't. But I think it's some weird acronym that's Python analysis and <laughs> data or something like that. But GeoPandas is basically an extension off of like working with data frames in Python, but working with geographic data. Um, and I'll show you actually once we load the data what it, what it looks like. Um, so the links here are kind of where the the where I, I pulled the data from, but it's also just within the data folder in here. This is kind of the pre-downloaded data. But if you want to know more about these data sets, which I actually encourage you to do, these the marginalization index and the CANBIX, which is the national data set on um, cycling infrastructure in Canada, are um, are super great data sets. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have used, used them before. And I, um, they're both shared through Canoe, but they're both open data as well. I don't think you need to go through Canoe to access them. Um, I know Canbix was, I think it was pretty sure it was generated by Megan Winters and her lab in, um, uh, in Vancouver. Um, and then we have a few other just general reference layers I'm going to add to the map. So kind of a boundary polygon for the area of Winnipeg and then some rivers and roads to, for general reference. So this block of code um, is simply just loading the data. Um, and the... Actually, I'll start with this one. So um, these are dissemination area boundaries of Winnipeg. So most of um, these are kind of census boundary polygons that lots of data are often uh, census data, but also lots of other data are calculated to and then can be linked to lots of other, other data sets as well, often linked to individual level data and a lot of health research that I'm sure some of you do. Um, 
And then these two are the data sets with the, the CAN Marge marginalization index and then the CANVIX um, Viking data. And this line of code is basically just merging it into a single data frame. Um, and these ones I'm not going to use for a little while, but these are the reference spatial data that we'll include on the map, um, all in GeoJSON format, which is a, I mean, it's, I don't think it's as used as much in kind of like the, the Esri Arc, ArcGIS space, but it's used a lot, particularly for web mapping stuff. And it's a very nice way to share spatial data because it's all, all just within one file rather than a shape file being spread across multiple files. Um, So in this line, I'm basically just um, showing what this data looks like after I've joined it. So I've created this um, data frame that is the combination of the geometry data, the marginalization data, and the cycling data um, merged into one data frame, basically just a table join merging on the common dissemination area unique ID, the DAUID. And then I'm printing out just to show what the data look like. So we have a unique identifier, the DAUID, the indicator of um, material deprivation or lack of material resources. CBICS is the cycling quality of cycling infrastructure indicator. And then we have a column for geometry. So this is where we can think of the, what is the, each one of these polygons, what they look like and how are they encoded with a, basically a list of coordinates. Um, so we haven't worked with a, Geopandas before, usually a ge like a geographic data frame in Python looks something like this, where you have some attribute data and then you have a column of geometry. So it's very similar to working with data in GIS, except it's in kind of just all in one table. Um, rather than having like a DBF and a, you know, a shape file separately, it's, this is just contained in one thing. Feel free to stop me if you have any questions, like um, the small group. So I think there's... Um, 15 or so. So um, I'm sure any question you have, it might be a useful question for somebody else as well. So I'm just noticing we're basically at the at 2 p.m. So I think just for this is a longer workshop, I think what I'll do, I guess, at the top now, but also maybe in the next hour is take a short break if uh, anybody needs it. But I encourage you, I think the next step, though, is to just plot some very simple um, univariate core plot map. So just kind of one dimensional, or, yeah, a core plot map of a single variable. Um, so um, if you don't need to take a break, feel free to just kind of read through this little section and, and try running the code. We can also change it and look at what some of the variables mean, and then maybe I can explain it briefly before then going on to the creating a bivariate map in about five, 10 minutes or so. I'm just going to run to fill up my water bottle.
So yeah, if you run the little block of code here, it should spit out two core plef maps, one for each of these variables. Essentially, what we're doing here is the data frame that we've created, this information here is that has a, we can set the, the option on it called plot. And this feeds in a bunch of parameters for what the output plot or map is going to look like um, for this core plot map. Um, it's the what column of data, what color scheme we want to use what kind of scheme we want to use for classifying the data. So this is using quantiles, so the equal number of um, um, dissemination areas in each category. So each has five categories in total, and each one is an equal amount. Um, we want to plot a legend. Um, and then this is the specific um, parameters for the legend. So putting it the title and where it's going to be located on the lower left and such. Um, Most of these kind of parameters can be adjusted in some way or another. I think it's just K, the, like we wanted not to do five categories instead of three. I think it's just called K. I realized I didn't do this in here. Yeah, now it only has three categories. So K is the number of, of categories you, you want to include in the map, but the default is five. Hi, this is Mika. Um, I often run into a situation where I would want to mask a certain area um, because it's maybe an outlier or uh, low population size. Mm -hmm. Is there a easy way to do that here, or would you just like exclude it from the data in the first place? Yeah, I think there's a couple ways to do it. I think you know, one way would be to yeah, just to Put a filter on this data set, data frame where, like, if you wanted to mask anything where the population was less than fifty or something like that, you could do that in here before you map it out. Um, but I think um, what I would probably do, and I think I in the the next tutorial I'll show an example of this, is um, actually map it in two layers where you have one layer where you've kind of filtered it out and then maybe another layer, either a background layer in the map or kind of just a, a filtered layer where it's only under that population to classify it in a different way. So then you could have a you know an item in your legend, for example, that says no data. Um, so you could essentially have two different layers, one above and one below that threshold, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so rule of thumb for deciding which classification scheme to use. I think that's a good question for sure. I mean, it's a, I don't know if I have a, a general rule of thumb. I think if I'm doing exploratory stuff, I'll generally start with quantiles. Um, but I do find that um, if I'm making kind of a map that's going in a paper, something wherever the map is going, um, I tend to actually look at the distribution of the data, like plot a histogram. Um, it's pretty straightforward to do this in QGIS, at least. I, I'm not, not too sure about ArcMap, but it, there's probably a, a tool for it too. Um, and then kind of uh, sometimes even by hand, pick my breaks where it fits over the, the distribution, or I'll use kind of one of those natural breaks or Jenks algorithms, I think, it, um, to kind of pick um, breaks that fit at the low points of the distribution. Um, but sometimes it's like I'll do, it really depends on what the data distribution look like and kind of what 
specific story I want to tell. I think in that population density map, um, you can see it's not like in, sometimes equal intervals are quite good, but I wanted to have an, an area for just, you know, pretty low population density. So we go from 500 to 2,500. Um, so it's, um, yeah, so kind of in lay that like, like values that lay audiences can understand. I don't know if this is exactly what um, I'm getting at, right? But um, I often just kind of go for nice rounded numbers. Um, yeah, yeah. Or some threshold or something. Depend, um, yeah, it does. The, the data. <laughs> I'm, yeah. And I'll, I'll be clear, I'm totally with Jeff on mapping the natural spatial mm -hmm. distribution. Um, but I guess I'm just warning folks if you haven't um, if you haven't worked in in the industry outside of academia much, you might get pushed back to um, recategorize the data in a way that either aligns with values that the organization is already using. Um, or that's easier for them to understand. So for example, like population density, um, they're just always going to want to use like per 10, 10,000, 100,000 people because it aligns with the policies of the province. Or yeah. um, a common one is like in access modeling. Um, there's clinical guidelines for things like stroke access, where if you're within or uh, they have to get a patient to a hospital within um, four hours to meet um, a pharmaceutical prescribing deadline for stroke. So it almost doesn't matter what the natural spatial distribution of access across a region is. They only want to know who's outside of that threshold. So that that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agreed. I think it definitely if there's some, a policy specific thing then then yeah then definitely use that um i i don't really have an example of it here but there's also um it sometimes depends on what your data are centered on um so if your data are like centered around zero and you have like you know positive like um you know the this lack of material resources that you said centered around zero so you could make an argument to do like a divergent classification scheme where it's going from like red to blue and the lightest color in the middle. There's also a lot of like, it's different from, you know, picking the breaks, but picking your colors too. There's um, some general rules of them, but not, um, there's never, never a hard and set, set rule. But okay, let's move on and um, talk about bivariate maps, which is more about what this, um, I guess workbook is about generally. Um, and so as I kind of said and showed at the beginning, these are taking two two variables and combining them into one classification scheme. Um, so the example I have here is you know a three by three classification scheme. I'm using again quantiles for this. But you know, the same principles here can be class, you know, for any sort of classification type. It doesn't, you can have two categories in one and four in another, or even like five and five, but there is something where the more colors you're adding to a map, the harder it is to for the reader to parse out the values. Sometimes I think even this is too many colors, depending on what the context is. Um, but I, I think I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, but how are we actually doing this kind of in, in Python? Um, there isn't really in Python or um, in GIS, like QGIS that I use, I mean, there isn't like a built-in function for doing this. Um, there might be a, a QGIS plugin that, that I don't know of, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is one. Um, so this process usually is to build a classification in one, build the classification in other, and then just merge these together. So you can see in the axis here, we have zero, one, and two. We have zero, one, and two, and then we're doing these joint classifications based off of where they fit within this matrix. Um, and there is a Python library for doing map classifications, which is basically the tool of functions or set of functions behind creating these um, classifications. It's a library called Map Classify. Um, it has a GitHub page and stuff you can click on on the link if you want to read more about it. 
Um, and that's basically, so if we're just typing in one of the variables and say we want three classes, it'll spit something out um, saying what those breaks are. And I'm pretty sure that would be the same as what would show up in the map, it should be. Um, so what we're gonna do is use this same function for each variable um, for three classifications. And in pandas, it's called a you know apply function where we're basically taking this and applying it to every row in that data frame. Um, and then, so we do it once for this variable, once for the material deprivation variable. And then this line of code basically just joins these two together um, and to a, um, into a single variable that we can map. So I'm just gonna quickly run this. Um, and this is the final group, but I think if we, to show the steps in between this, I'll add the other ones as well. Rolling true, that's that's a good question. I wasn't actually, I don't, I don't know if I have an exact answer for that one. I think we might have to pull up the um, documentation and see. Um, I think it was one of those parameters I had copied over from the the example before, and then didn't fully look to, to see what it did, which maybe isn't always the best uh, um, practice. Um, maybe it has it in their documentation page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not 100%, but I assume it has something to do with when it's applying that function to every single item in the data frame. One way to find out, I think, just to try to set it to false and see, like, see what it does. Nope, something didn't work. Um, so yeah, my answer is I do not know exactly what the parameter does, but it could be. I my hunch is it's something about applying it to every row in the data frame properly. Um, because it doesn't seem we don't set it, then it'll error out. Oh, I just had an error there. Uh, let's go back to something else.
or maybe it's part of the order that it's applying to. Yeah, I think it's more due to making sure it's applying it to the, reapplying it back to the, um, the row that it's um, it should be applied to rather than just spitting it out into kind of like the order that it did the calculation at. Okay, but once we get our kind of grouped classification on the right side, we can then actually start mapping this out. Um, and so these are just a few different examples of colors. And usually when we're coloring stuff and um, um, depending on what the tool we're using in Python, for example, but in, you know, similar in R or GIS or something, we're often working with these kind of hex color codes. Um, so I've basically just taken kind of the hex color codes I had used in put it within this like color mapping dictionary. Um, and then we can feed this into our plot that we're actually using to make the data um, or to make the map, sorry. Um, so this is a much bigger block of code um, to create kind of the, the output map we have at the bottom. Um, and I'll go through it this one by one. You can, you're free to just kind of run it and lay the output will work, but um, the first is just like putting a, a layer down for the border of Winnipeg. The next one is actually plotting the, the data. Um, and you can see that the color is coming from the, we're using the group variable that we had created here. And we're running this kind of map function to actually map from a, and the different, since the term mapping, more of an abstract term, the, variable to each one of these colors. Um, so it's taking basically this dictionary, taking, okay, we know that it's the zero two classification, you know, we know it's this one, this pink value, um, this five, seven, three, four, nine, three, and then coloring that onto the map. These two are more reference layers, in this case, streets and, um, well, one of these is rivers, this should say rivers, but uh, rivers and streets. And this is adding kind of a custom legend to the map because there's no built-in tool for doing a bivariate map um, that we kind of have to create this custom legend, which I don't really like. I'm gonna talk about kind of legend design in a little bit, but um, this is just like kind of a hacky piece of code to spit out a legend at least. And then this should be the output that you get. Uh, And then it's certainly, I mean, I haven't done this, but it would be certainly possible to kind of combine, let's say, this classification code within to the, at the top of this code block, um, or even within kind of like a for loop or something, if we wanted to like loop over, excuse me, loop over several different variables and make several um, of these core plot maps, it would be relatively straightforward to do. Um, and I've used that before as kind of just a, you know, um, exploratory, um, mapping technique to look at correlation between two different variables. At least from a visual sense, it doesn't do a statistical test, but um, you could you could probably add that as well into your code if you wanted to. So hopefully everybody was able to spit out something that looks like this.
And then um, this is a much more of a general thing, at least from my view. I mean, it's um, I'm not very good at making like very nice map layouts through just through kind of code or what a default like the default options um, that GIS provides, whether it be Esri stuff or QGIS or um, other things as well. Like basically like tinkering with the precision of like the font sizes and where like the padding and stuff of like exactly how a legend is going to be placed. Like this is pretty ugly. I mean, it's, and it's, I realize I'm already missing like, you know, what the categories and the sides are and things like that. And I don't have other things on the map as well. And um, I also find that a lot of the defaults don't really, even kind of the defaults like this, where the core block maps. Um, I don't really like the look of them. That's kind of, you know, I've some people can make very pretty maps just by kind of tinkering with these elements. Um, I'm not really, I mean, I've done a couple of times before, but I, yeah, generally I think my workflow um, and one that I generally recommend too, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit biased is to take whatever the base output is and then input it, load it within like a, some sort of, graphic design software and there's a you know a variety of types I, I use something called Inkscape which I'll show but um which is a vector graphic software that's free to use but um you know there's lots of the Adobe suite software so Illustrator is the parallel to Inkscape that maybe some of you use Photoshop is um obviously super popular and that's more raster based graphics but um and there's even like web tools like Canva to use for this kind of thing um as well but I'll show you what this looks like in Links Inkscape and how I kind of draw out um, some of the other map elements. And I'll do this especially if I know, like it's not a um, process I would recommend if you're doing exploratory data analysis, like if you wanna make like 10 maps of bivariate cor um, correlations, um, bivariate maps showing you know correlations between two variables. And it's probably not the best tool for that um, because it would take a while to generate kind of custom maps each time. Although there would be kind of, there are some ways to script it. But um, if you're making just a, you know, one map or a couple to fit into a paper or report or poster or something, um, it's definitely the workflow I would recommend. Um, so what I'm gonna do is basically this line saves this figure. Um, um, and this is the file name I'm saving it as. I'm saving it as an SVG file, which, um, is a vector graphic format that's used a lot for um, in web development. It's just a markup language, kind of like XML or um, HTML. It's a um, the data are coded kind of like as a markup language like that. Um, but the kind of the output is that each one of these kind of layers in the map is like a vector data set in the vector graphics software we can play with and stylize additionally if we want to, or just I tend to just load it and then add my own layout elements. Um, so I'll save it um, and then I'll open it up in Inkscape. This is just a screenshot of what Inkscape looks like to show kind of how I design more of the map elements around it um, and can do it relatively quickly as well and get something I like within like a 10, 15 minute time frame. Obviously it can take a lot more time if, uh, um, Sometimes I take a lot more time if I'm just like tinkering with it, um, particularly if I want to get be distracted from some other work. Um, sometimes I just tinker it with like map layout items. Um, but yeah, just give me a second, I'll, I'll load it up. Oh, it's on the other screen. Okay. Oh, I got where it. Okay, there it is. Um, so this is kind of like the final product in a sense. Um, where so software like this, if you haven't worked with it before, um, it's very similar to GIS. You're basically working with things in layers. Um, where in this case, I've just basically built three layers. One of them is the map. And this is the default thing that I've just exported from, um, from Python using that line of code. Um, I think I did it before. I must have commented out the legend so that the legend wasn't included um, when I 
did it the first time, but um, basically just that kind of line there. Um, and I didn't want to just have the white background because I thought it distracted a little bit from, it was hard to differentiate from like the low colors on the map. So I just added a background square to it. And this is just a square you can draw onto the map. Um, like there's a square function, you kind of draw out a square. This one doesn't have a fill, but it has a, a stroke width around it. Um, and then these were all the layout items that I drew onto the map as well. Um, so each one of these is just, there's a, you know, option for creating text, creating different shapes. Um, and so I just kind of drew these on myself in a way that I thought fit into the empty white space around the map. So I think in terms of thinking about, talked about balance at the little bit of the beginning of this um, workshop. And I noticed before I had these in here, this was my biggest empty space. And I thought it would be the most obvious space to put a legend that was square. Um, so that's why I put this, it was kind of a one second decision, but it was like, I think it's one of those things that makes the most sense of where to put a legend, um, particularly one that's like this. Maybe if it was just a univariate choropleth map, I would have put it somewhere else or thought about it a little bit differently. And then I used the, the other space on the map for the other map elements, uh, basically. Um, can I add in the North here? I know this question about it before. I probably don't need to include it, but that's the, I did include it in this sense. Um, and so this isn't, I think, the most beautiful map at all, I think, but it um, it's something that's, you know, it's functional, it works, it tells the story of kind of picking up these areas onto the map. Um, and then the layout I items, um, in my, my view, kind of cohesively fit within the overall context of the map. And the one other thing, oh, I should say as well, is that the um, export is a vector graphic, but you can also export it just as a raster image if it's working, if you have a lot of vector data. Um, like the more dense, like if you have a lot of like intense geometry on your map and your data files that you're showing, it's probably that better to export it as a raster image rather than a vector image. So it's a PNG or something. Um, and then export just in that image. Um, And, oh yeah, so in the plotting function, this is in inches, the size of the approximate, like the, the output plot is going to be. And so I set up the page layout here to be seven inches by seven inches. And that would, that would be something approximately that would fit pretty well into a report or something like that. Yeah, so I, I think I can just do this from scratch. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll show a case of hopefully this will work. Um, instead of doing a vector graphic, I'll just do a image file. So a very standard image is PNG or a JPEG, for example. And I think this should go into this is my export file. I don't really like the legend. Let's say let's say I wanted to get rid of the legend, um, for example. I'm just gonna comment that out, and hopefully this will work. Yep, so there's the map without a legend. I'm going to re-export this. Um, maybe I have to reload it. Oh yeah, so now the legend is gone, um, which is nice. And I'll just open up a blank Inkscape file. Um, so it defaults to a page that looks like this. I, I know from my, in Python, I wanted this to be seven inches by seven inches. Um, and there's a document properties, um, option, um, or like, uh, way you can lay this that basically allows you to set the paper space of what it looks like, but it can also give you like guides and grids and things like that. Um, one of them is to set size. So I know this is in inches and I'm just gonna change this to seven inches by seven inches. So usually when I'm starting to work on a kind of a layout thing, I set the size first. Um, and then my kind of toolbox options on the side, I have an option for importing an image. So this can be um, defaults to a different project I was working on, but um, 
have to kind of locate on your computer where this image is. So I have to find where it is. Um, and so this is the, the image here, shows up on the map. Um, it's a little bit kind of zoomed in a little bit. I don't know why that happened. Um, but I think, I mean, I can go back to the Python and export it a little bit with a, a smaller border, but I think just for the sake of time, I'll keep it like this. Um, like I kind of just center it in the page. And then this is kind of one of the layers in my map. And let's say I want to add another layer on top, um, on top of the image. And then I can start actually adding in, for example, like say it's Winnipeg, I want to add a legend to it. I can start drawing little squares for, um, you know, the different colors on the map. You can pick the colors on directly, draw this square using the little ink picker, picker thing. I forget what this tool is called. Pick colors from image, yeah. So this is pretty useful. So I, I want to start drawing a legend. Sometimes I'll do just do this manually. I know it seems a little uh, silly not to just do this, generate this um, through a tool, but I find I can, after a kind of working with the software for you know a couple of years, I can draw it relatively quickly and then pretty quickly as well, um, draw out uh, things that are a lot more custom. Um, I think for now, what I'll do is just copy this up, copy and paste this over. But um, so for oh yeah, there it is. I don't know why that took a second. But you know, for example, if I wanted to rotate this legend a little bit and keep it like this, which sometimes we do buy very maps kind of like in this style, where you have, um, I guess it depends on the context, but. Um, I would have to rotate these probably as well. Um, I don't know if this kind of totally answers your question, but um, this is kind of the workflow I'll generally work through. So start by loading in the actual base image and then start bringing in my other um, um, drawing in my other uh, layout items. Yeah, so the scale is one thing I, I drew in manually too. Um, based off of just kind of a distance I knew of, um, I kind of just referenced that a distance. So it's not, a, you know, 100% exact. Um, and same with the North Arrow too, I just drew that drew that manually. Um, and again, I guess, you know, I'm sure a few of you are thinking of like, this is obviously more work than just going through um, a default export option, but um, um, I don't know. It's partly something that I, I think ends up with a nicer product if you spend like the time to do it. Like sometimes something like this will take me only 10 minutes. Sometimes I'll sit here for an hour or two or something like tinkering with the elements till it's aligned to something that I like. And plus you can have like, personally, I have a lot of fun like drawing like the, you know, I drew a little, drew a little white border around some of these things. I mean, um, you can do a lot of this stuff, you know, probably by code as well. But um, it's just like, as I think I said before, it's not like it's you know one tool is better than the other. But this is going through and drawing it by hand. I find it um, for me ends up with a product that I am happier with at the end of the day. But I think one thing and before kind of moving on to the next tutorial, I want to say I don't, you know, I think the choice of, you know, make what style or classification seem to use on a map generally, like whether to use a bivariate map or not, like it's totally dependent on the context. And I think it's something where, you know, if you're particularly interested in kind of picking out these high and low values or looking at kind of overall patterns between these two variables, like it's a useful tool for that and can make a, you know, a useful map that'll communicate something. Um, 
But I do find with these maps, and I don't know if, you know, maybe some of you thought this even while going through this tutorials that like, I actually find it kind of hard to pick out some of these middle values, like intuitively, like I look at, say like, okay, this purple, okay, then I have to like slowly go back to the legend and see, okay, it's kind of this middle value, then, then what does that mean? So I do find that these, yeah, the re the color selection, yeah, it's super important. I think, yeah, and even adding like hashing patterns or something can help. And I think it's, but it these um, maps like this, I think you can add more, no matter how good our kind of our colors and patterns we pick in the map, um, because we're mapping two variables at the same time and there's nine different options, at least on this map, it's going to take longer for the reader to actually pick it out and um, kind of pick out the values. And I think that extra time to look at a map isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. Like it depends on the context, but um, I think it's just like be something to think about depending on what the context of what you're making is. Um, yeah, so I think um, so. The question was resources for yeah vector baked graphics and how did I get started in Inkscape? Yeah. Oh, so that's cool. I used like posters and images and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know I think that's probably a way a lot of people start. I know like people are making posters for an event. I'm sure there's things like that. There's um, and use it as well. I mean, Inkscape is just like one of many tools that are like this. I learned it by doing things like this. Um, but I've also done like academic posters, I think, using Inkscape as well, I think. Yeah, no, I definitely have like, um, um, or sometimes making little icons for something as well. But again, it's kind of a tool like, I mean, it's probably similar to working with Excel or GIS or something where it takes a while to learn where all the buttons are and some of the functions. And there's things in here that I've never touched and I don't know what they do. Um, but I, I find learning something like this, and I, I would probably like, you know, scale that up to learning most technical things is um, having a project that I want to do. For example, like um, I have this map I want to create. How can I take it to... Um, how do I kind of add these layout items? This I know it's a very applied example to just this, but yeah. Um, the way I typically learn is, you know, in a very project based. I am not actually very good at following other people's tutorials and workshops, despite you know, I just kind of I gave I gave basically what I'm doing here. Like there, I find it helpful, but it's often you know, it's going through a project that I want to do is how I learn learn the best. But yeah, I agree, agree, right? Trying to break it out into smaller, smaller steps is, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of play around. That's how I learned with this one is like, yeah, it's not one specific tutorial. Although, you know, learning is, you know, if you want to know, like, how do I do this in Inkscape like you would do in any anything else? Like, um, there are probably specific tutorials for it. I think the key thing, though, is if you're bringing in, especially with this kind of software, one thing I will recommend is, where whenever possible to work in layers, like even this, like we could separate this and have a layer just for the title and a layer just for the legend and things like that. Um, it's, it can be, um, it helps a lot if you're working with lots of, lots of, you know, let's say you had the layers for labels on the map and things like that. Sometimes I actually do my labeling on a map within software like this, because I generally don't like how GIS exports labels. I mean, um, to really the kind of the specificity that I like sometimes. Um, sometimes it's okay, but um, yeah, I'll sometimes add my own labels for like a city or a road or something directly in this, even if it takes more time. Okay, I think I'm looking at the the clock. So I think what I would like to do is switch over to the next tutorial, which is about dot maps. Um, and so this one I think is a little bit longer than this one, slightly, um, but it follows the same kind of process where like prepare some data in Python and then um, do some of the layout items actually next time in this time in QJS a little bit too, I wanna to talk about. So, um, I think what I'll do is let's take another short break now. Um, and if you go back into the folder structure, 
if you look up at categorical dot maps and click on that and then click the next Python notebook um, or just like navigate to the links that we sent initially that would also work too but it's all within the same folder structure so you could just find it in here and then maybe we'll do a start in about uh I don't know let's say six minutes at 250. Jeff can we do 10 minutes sure yeah okay
Okay, before we get started again, I just want to, it's kind of just my own kind of interest, but um, um, I'm personally interested in kind of like the, the history of cartography and the, when I was going through and putting this material together for bivariate maps, I was, I thought this was surprising that like it only, the first bivariate maps really only started being published in the 1970s. Um, and it's partly, I mean, partly maybe surprising for me because most kind of thematic mapping techniques like core plot maps have been around for much, much longer, like univariate core plot maps and dot maps, which I'll be talking about next, I'll go back to, I think the first dot map was sometime in the 1800s, maybe even the 1700s. Um, or maybe 1800s. Yeah, I just found it on Wikipedia. I get my other tab. Like this is the very first like dot map, which I'll talk about of population density in France from 1830 um, that was published. Um, but yeah, these bivariate core plot maps are only more of a recent um, phenomenon, um, at least in terms of like maybe people had made them before, but in terms of being like very um, like published and distributed more widely. Do you think, Jeff, that's because of the way that um, people were parceling land ownership? Like I don't know. I mean, it's like, yeah, because, you know, just doing like a shaded map of like, you know, normal core plot map, like, like the, uh, these kind of maps. I mean, this is obviously, but like go back, I think at least a hundred years. So it's like, it's combining these two variables on one map, which is I think relatively simple idea, I guess that nobody did it in term more recently. So yeah, it might be a color printing thing and everything else is black and white and with black and white. Yeah, that, that's probably a good good guess is why it was the case, but. Um, yeah, yeah, also I was, um, I was watching this documentary by Penn State and also maybe like the invention of the airplane to fly and take aerial photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be definitely like a techno, I don't know, it's possible, yeah, like being a major, like technological hurdle that eventually led to it, but. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, let's get started on the next uh, workshop because I it's been about 10 minutes or so. Um, and so this one is more on, this is about dot maps. And so these have been, as I just mentioned, been around for a lot longer. Um, and so dot maps use like single points um, and lots of these points to represent the distribution of something. Um, so they're often used to show, you know, distribution of populations. There's very common kind of demographic maps, but, you know, you dot maps can also be used to represent any kind of other phenomenon. Um, I've seen some really cool ones of, uh, of wildlife in places um, and distribution of, um, of such. Um, but the benefit of them, this is an example of what we'll be creating because it was just a dot map of housing in Toronto. Um, but the benefit of them compared to like just a core plot map of a shaded area is that they can show both, um, you know, relative density, so more concentrations in one households and like in households or dwellings in one area compared to another, as well as relative proportions. So, you know, for this map is showing percentage of people who rent or own. Um, so it's showing both the concentration overall of these type of dwellings, but also the proportion of which in each, um, um, in different parts of the city and at different scales. This is um, Toronto, obviously. Um, and so dot maps like this are often based off of uh, census data. And so similar to what we were just working with, like this is data that's usually kind of aggregated at spatial boundaries, like dissemination areas um, or even larger units. Um, so kind of dot maps like this aren't really perfect representations of where people exactly live. Like each dot is basically just an, like an, an estimate within that dissemination area. So if we know that there's a hundred people that live in a dissemination area and we wanna make a map of, you know, um, one dot in this case equals 10 households, then we would just randomly place 10 dots within that dissemination area. And I'll talk a little bit about the asymmetric mapping is which using other data to um, have a better estimate of where to place these dots in a dissemination area 
that are more likely to where people live. So um, they're using land use data for this, but we could also use, um, you know, building footprint data and, uh, you know, smaller level population data for if we're working with uh, demographic data. Um, so the goal of this workshop, we kind of go through and create this example of a map, but again, similar to the other one, it's like it can be totally like plug and play to any other data and other kind of geography as well. Um, so in Python, what I'm going to show is basically how to create this kind of dot file. And then I'm going to use kind of um, QGIS to talk about a little bit more about symbology and um, of that at that final layer. Because um, if it's often the case as well, where um, the previous map was relatively simple, but sometimes I find if I'm working with a larger data file, like this case, I think is you know thousands of these dots, um, I'll use GIS to work on the final kind of like color and symbology of it, and then go from GIS to export it to Inkscape or something else. Usually in Scape for us, but um, or as software like that for the final layout items, like in this case, the little legend and uh, title and stuff on the top. So similarly to before, I mean, we can run the little intro import statements. Um, and similar data to before, we have dissemination area polygons. Um, there's a tabular data set on, you know, housing tenure, which is whether somebody rents or owns their property or their home in the city. Um, and then we have a few, I have a couple extra like reference layers for the map as well, um, particularly the Lake Ontario shoreline, and then also some transit lines we can put on top of the map. Um, and then also some land use data, which we'll be using for select or how to generate these dots. Um, so this loads the, I'm just going to load the census data first. And we have one file for the boundaries and one file for the attribute data. That's just a GeoJSON and a CSV. Sometimes this, you can download this and it comes all together, but um, in this case, it's separate. So, um, and then I'm merging the data here, but had to do a little bit of a finagling to make sure both the columns the DAU ID we're merging on were both strings I think one was originally a number and one was a string so it wasn't merging properly I think the first time I did this um, which is often the case when we're bringing in data from different sources um, and then I'm printing just printing out the um, the first five rows of the data frame to take a look so again this is a um, geopandas data frame we have some geometry data the shape of these polygons and then a bunch of other data attribute data attached to it. So in this case, the unique dissemination area UID, which we're using to join the data, but then also we have data on land area if we wanted some other census IDs. And then this data over here is from the tabular data set. And this says the number of people who own, the number of people of, that rent, and then of those that own, the number of people who have a mortgage, and the number of people who rent that live in subsidized housing. So for at least these five rows, nobody lives in rents within subsidized housing. So um, we'll do some kind of just like very intro, like let's just look at some of these variables. Um, and so before doing this, I want to kind of just generate some total categories. So just what's the total number of households? So I just adding the owners and the renters. And then I want to know kind of the opposite of this category. So what's the number of people who don't have a mortgage? And what's the number of people who don't rent and subsidize housing? So I'm just kind of creating three new variables through this. So the owning without a mortgage is those who own and minus those who own with a mortgage. So yeah, now we have basically four types of households that add up to the total number of households in a dissemination area. So people own with a mortgage who own without a mortgage, rent and subsidized housing, and rent not in subsidized housing. Um, and with this, we can make um, core plus maps of the percent of each one of these categories. So um, it's a decent chunk of code here, but um, it's actually a little bit shorter than what it might need to be because um, I'm creating up four plots. And so what I'm going to do is create loop over each one of these variables and create a plot for each and then comes out as four um, mini plots essentially next to each other. These kind of plots are also sometimes called small multiples where we have four, like more than one map or plot of the same 
um, thing, like or the same context, but just changing up the variable. And it does allow us to compare it between these different patterns. So this is very similar to the kind of univariate core plot maps from the previous workshop. Might take a little while to run, hopefully not too long. Let's see if some things. Oh yeah, let's spit out the things. And there was a question earlier about kind of having a no data area on the map. Um, and so in this case, I was just kind of curious in that sense. So all I did was have a dissemination area boundary file plotted underneath that's just all yellow. And then anything with data is plotted on top. So I can quickly parse out those areas, no data. Now the yellow probably isn't like it stands out maybe a bit too much if I was actually going to put these kind of maps in a report or something, but this is more for my own kind of like self-exploratory sense to see if we're where there is missing data in this context. And it was most likely because there are no um households in this area. So I'm at what I'm actually plotting is the percent, which is the variable divided by the total multiplied by 100. So if I'm the total is zero, it's gonna spit out some indefined um um pre like value that the it doesn't know how to plot so it just doesn't plot anything there at all so the no data in this sense is i think essentially means that there's no households there yeah again feel free to ask questions as i'm slowly going through this So these kind of um, four maps compared to each other can be you know, pretty useful in kind of just highlighting the patterns in these four variables. Um, but they do have some limitation um, that would require kind of further mapping to really explore. Um, and so like one is that they only show the percent of each variable. Um, so you know, the dark air, darkest is like you know, 80 to 100 percent of households in these areas um, you know, own with a mortgage in the top left one. But they don't show kind of the density. So we, you know, a dark value, a, the darkest black or darkest gray value um, in one zone, like might have like, you know, 50 house, households, but in another zone, like another zone, it might have a thousand, for example. But as long as like the percent is the same, it's colored the same. Um, the, since we're doing kind of these small multiples, like we can, they're good for exploring kind of overall patterns in each of them, but. It's hard to kind of look at specific neighborhoods. Um, we would really have to zoom in. Um, another kind of issue with some doing mapping census data generally is that some census boundaries are actually quite large and include lots of parks and industrial areas and retail space and things like that. Um, and this doing a map like this generalizes the um, the variable across that entire space. Well, in reality, you know, household from you know only. And some of these DAs really only maybe live in a small quadrant or of it, just one block or just one apartment building. Um, well, other DAs, like it's like a, you know, pretty much the same type of housing throughout the entire DA. It's all just single detached housing, for example. Um, so making a dot map can, um, has some benefits, beyond like doing a core plot map, particularly be able to map both uh, a densities or concentrations of, of some phenomena like households, as well as kind of relative proportions to each other. Um, so the little schematic I drew here, actually, this is an example of drawing something in Inkscape that I isn't necessarily like a, you know, an output of a map, but it's kind of just a figure I wanted to put something. Um, but this is showing how we would create kind of a dot map for just one zone, for example. Um, and so, for example, a dissemination area that looks like this, this is kind of a weirdly shaped one. I don't know exactly the way I drew it like this. Um, we would just place the dots randomly within it. And then we would do this, for example, for every single dissemination area in Toronto, I think there's almost 4,000 of them. And then that's kind of what the final layer in the map would look like. Um, usually for a dot map, 
or I'll always the case for a dot map. We have to decide on some rate of um, like phenomena per dot. So in this case, I've tried to do, and I've this is what this little piece of code does there. It's saying, okay, we want this rate of dot or households per dot to be 10. So let's say there's 10 households for every dot within the map, the map we're finally going to create. So I've created four additional variables about the number of dots we need to generate for each DA. Um, basically just dividing by the number or taking the number of you know, people in this category or households in this category and dividing by this rate of households per dot. So if there's 100 people or households in the DA divided by 10 would equal 10 dots. Um, and then we place these randomly. So the an improvement to this, um, which I mentioned before, is to only try to place dots where we think people live. So clipping out areas of parks, of retail space, um, and not placing dots within those. So this requires kind of a you know a spatial overlay or clip operation um, of the dissemination areas by any some land use data or other data that we have that'll tell us that um, people don't live in this area. Um, so let's try to do this for Toronto. And for Toronto, luckily, um, I probably picked up because we have this relatively good land use data. Um, that might take a second to load and plot um, of different types of land use in the city. Um, and these are the 10 or so, 10, 10 categories of land use that's in within this data set. Um, so I'll let you guys quickly kind of load this and plot it and take a look. Um, it might take a sec to load because I think it's a relatively large file. Hopefully it's okay uh, for those of you who are doing this on Binder. So looking through this kind of classification of land use, um, oh, this is a question first. How, how do you get the dots in the legend to not cover the first few characters of the element name? Yeah, for some reason, when I printed out the- This uh, map here, or- uh, The one right before it, so with the dissemination areas this here oh sorry yeah actually no it's just the way that mine's showing up sorry yeah sorry was it this figure or was it the other one yeah actually yeah that's the figure that you created so it's just it's just showing it up just be an image so it's not like yeah, it's a, yeah. Um, this one might depending on if you set the figure size to be different or something the legend might overlap with the part of the map, but um, but uh, I mean that's okay. You can just tinker with the the default should should work. I think hopefully. Um, but yeah, so just looking at the classes here, we can see that you know we can kind of guess which ones you know have probably have dwellings within that the people live in. Um, I did double check this with the documentation, but it's the ones that are um, classified as neighborhoods, um, apartment neighborhoods, or as mixed use um and the other ones tend to pertain to things like uh you know parks and natural areas and open space and things like that or employment um employment zones um the one that's kind of like a little ambiguous is institutional which i often pertain to universities as well and there might be residences on them but i decided you know could have included these but i decided not to think that people live there because usually the census is collected in May after students move out of university. So usually these areas don't have a lot of population based off of census data, but um, um, yeah, although you could easily just add them into the classification here. So I've created this variable called res classes, which is just residential classes, and then filtered the this data frame that we loaded, which is basically all of this, just whether these three classes are within the column called class name. 
So I guess just to you know, so yeah, this is what the data frame looks like. So it's just basically this little query here is just filtering out only give me the roads that are rows, sorry, not roads that are apartment neighborhoods, neighborhoods or mixed use. And then you know, it's just very anytime we can always just print and double check if it works and it looks like it mostly did work, although I'm not printing all 18,000 rows I'm just it defaults to just printing 10 or so. Um, and then what we want to do is take our dissemination area boundary file, which is um, basically covers the entire city of Toronto and um, remove basically, or just um, select out just from those that are residential areas. Um, basically things that fall within this, um, spatially intersect with this subset of the land use data frame that we create. Um, so in, we can do this in, um, in pandas or especially using geopandas to do this, but, um, this is a pretty common, I think if you've probably taken like a second year GIS course, this is one of like the several spatial overlay operations you would learn how to do. This is, this one's specifically an intersect, but I think they're, you know, doing a union or um, clipping and symmetrical difference are all kind of other different types of uh, spatial overlay op, you know, um, tools that do a slightly different thing. But in Geopandas, there's a you know a function called overlay, and then you specifically feed in your two data frames, um, the one that you want to um, your base data frame, and then the second one you're using to kind of like clip out or uh, intersect what you you want to um, pull out from it. And then I'm also appending on this extra dissolve parameter, and so essentially what happens in just this part is that it will leave. Um, let's say there's like two residential zones within a dissemination area. This will take out basically so keep those as two separate rows. So there'll be a dissemination area um, polygon with just um, a, one of those residential areas and one for the other. And to generate dots afterwards, I want these to be all with, within one multi polygon feature. Um, so that's what the, the second part does to get around that one. This step might take a little while because it's we're intersecting like um, you know, three thousand, three almost four thousand DAs by I think I forget how long by another like seventeen or eighteen thousand polygons. Although it didn't take very long, I think um, these spatial intersections I've noticed in GeoPandas are much faster than desktop GIS software because it's using a I think a different, more efficient kind of underlying library for doing these kind of spatial operations, um, and in this little. Um, plot. I'm just showing for a few DAs what the result looks like. Um, so I'm first just plotting what the, um, or so this plots the dissemination area boundaries, and this is plotting the dissemination area boundaries after they've been intersected with the residential areas. Um, so we can see that we have four DAs here. We have this kind of big one. We have this little one here. This rectangular one and then this big wonky one. Um, and we basically remove from these dissemination areas all this other area where people don't live. So when we actually are randomly placing dots in the next part of this, they'll only get placed in these yellow areas. Um, so if you know where this is in Toronto, I would be very impressed, um, maybe that. Um, just by its kind of, although it does have this very distinct kind of shape. So this is probably the most like GIS-y geoprocessing part of this, um, creating this map. Hopefully this step here, this overlay intersection didn't take super long.
so yeah so i just i'm not too sure if you're watching my screen or not there you might have been looking at your own but all i did was not instead of just plotting four da's now i'm just plotting them all and this is what it looks like across toronto and you can see um might be a little bit hard to see but the black lines are the dissemination areas and the yellow are those um the dissemination areas basically after all the non-residential area was removed just focusing on those that likely have where people live this little tail thing is basically just plotting the last four rows in the launch data frame this is a lot more zoomed in into that one it does look like there's this little sliver here which is a little odd and something maybe in the land use data that like maybe it overlaps to like another residential area here so the next step to this is to now once we actually have this breach dissemination area a good guess of where people live is to now estimate a written um place dots within these areas um depending on like the number of dots that we want to place but we spend a number of households so kind of the key part of this is um, a little function that takes a polygon and generates a random or a dot randomly placed within that polygon. Um, so if we think for, let's say, we're not, we won't be using this polygon, but I'm just going to use it as an example. We have this polygon here. It'll just place a dot randomly with inside it. Um, I won't really go in detail too much in the function, but essentially the way it works is it just takes the bounding box of the polygon, sees if the place is a random point within that bounding box, um, just by like a random number generator if it's within those bounds, and then checks if it falls interest, especially intersects with the, the polygon itself. Um, and so this works for generating one dot for one polygon. Um, and then it's just a function in Python. Um, and then what we do is apply this to um, um, every single row in our, where's our data frame? In our data frame. So for every single one of these counts, or sorry, for every single one of like the number of dots we want to generate, which we generated uh, in this step. So yeah, the we're what we're gonna do is loop over um each row in the data frame. Actually, I'll just print the data frame right before just so we can look at it again. Um oh it printed kind of funny. Okay. That was it. So each row is kind of a polygon. Um and we have Well, maybe I didn't run this one. Uh, might have forgot to run this this row. It's one of those things with working out a notebook. You have to remember to run everything in order. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to do. Okay, now I have the. Uh, the number of dots I want to generate for each one. And so I'm going to loop over every row and then each one of these four columns and then generate that number of dots that I want for um, for each one of those columns. Yeah, so for this loops over every row in the data frame, this loops over these four variables. Um, and then I have n, which is kind of the the number of pulling out that number of dots um, and rounding it to the nearest integer, and then looping over basically, um, and then for each one of those numbers, starting at basically at zero and going up to less than n, um, generating that many dots, and then saving it to kind of an output um, 
array for now. Um, and then once I do that for go through each one, I take this output. Um, actually, I might do this part in steps just so I can show you what it looks like. So right now I'm going to save everything to this output file. This might take also about a minute as well, because it has to generate like um, it's a lot of dots it generates in the uh, thousands, if not millions, uh, not, maybe not the millions, because it's 10 households, maybe about 100,000 in total it's generating. Okay, cool. Um, so it took about 30 seconds. And for things that take longer in Python, I add this little uh, time like mini function. I don't know exactly what it's called. It's kind of a Jupyter notebook specific thing. And it'll spit out at the end how long something took, um, which can be kind of helpful if you're planning to work with lots more data, I want to kind of like time out how long something's going to take. Um, so I've saved everything to this output array, um, basically, and then I'm going to convert this into a data frame. Um, I'll spit out what that looks like. So you can see what we've created. Um, basically, what we have now is an xy coordinate for a dot and the classification that it's part of. So one of these four classifications. Um, but yeah, a little over 100,000 of these in total. So each one of these dots coordinates now represents 10 households who own their um, own their dwelling, and they have a mortgage. Each one of these ones at the very bottom of the data frame are at this coordinate in space are 10 households that rent, but not in subsidized housing. Um, so we could export this just as a CSV file and open it in GIS. Um, I tend to, well, sometimes, not all the time, uh, convert things into a GeoJSON format simply to make it easier for loading when I can just drag it and drop it in GIS rather than having to um, load and specify like what the coordinates are. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier for working with spatial data in the future, but it's kind of just an extra step that's not always necessary. I mean, we could just save this as a CSV and, and work with it. But that's what essentially this little piece of code here does. It's um, converts the x, y into like a specific geometry object that's um, um, that's used in geo data frames, and then pan geo pandas allows for exporting and loading as well, of course, to a range of spatial data formats. Um, geo JSON being one, but you know, obviously shape files and stuff as well. Um, so that's what this little uh, snippet of code does. And it also makes it a little bit better for making like maps as well in, in uh, GeoPandas. So this last little bit puts the makes a, a map of the result of all these little dots. And uh, being 100,000 of them, they do take some time. Um, and we can see where they are in the city here. I mean, the default colors, I don't really love. Um, but I'll talk about the kind of the coloring in a little bit. Um, this is kind of where another step, like kind of like I stopped at kind of after creating the map with the bivariate map, I kind of stopped and went, okay, I'm going to go over to Inkscape and do the final touches. This is also a case where like I prepped this data that I want to visualize using Python. And this is kind of an extra step sometimes and I'll bring this into GIS. I use QGIS mostly um, and then visualize this spatial data in there because I tend to like doing kind of coloring and more symbology within, um, particularly with multiple layers sometimes within GIS rather than just in Python.
but I'll wait here for a couple minutes before bringing this data into GIS and just in case anybody has any questions too. All right, yeah, this one's okay. Actually, one before I bring the data into JS, I do want to go back and say one other thing. I mean, I kind of decided, I mean, I did this rate of um, this is the final map of you know, one dot equals 10 households. And I always find like when I've made maps like this before, these dot maps, deciding on this rate, I always find very difficult. And it's kind of one of those things where I try different values. Sometimes I try a one dot equals five households, one dot equals 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. And it's usually just kind of like a trial and error thing until I find something that doesn't feel, you know, way too dense or way too sparse. Um, it's more of just kind of feeling it out and um, landing on a number that I think makes the most sense for the, whatever the story is. So um, this is already like a in the actually sorry. Um, within the data folder here, there is a Q, dot .qgis, Q, or qgz, which is a qgis project file that kind of loads these all these reference layers, including the dots file we just generated and saved. Um, and so I kind of pre-created this as kind of a, just to save a little bit of time here, but I'll show you how I kind of organized in GIS. Um, so, Again, this is kind of a case where it could have probably continued down the kind of the Python path to really try to fine tune the visualization of all these layers and uh, particularly this dot layer. But it's partly my own kind of comfort in when I'm working with making maps that are a little bit more complex and have a lot more data to do it within QGIS and work with kind of the um, symbologies tools within here. Um, again, this is kind of a personal preference thing, but I do find it. Uh, yeah, personally, it's I can, um, I can fine tune things a, a lot more to my own preference. But again, it's one of those things if you're doing a lot more exploratory analysis and want to pump out a bunch of maps, it might be better to actually script it. Of course, you can also do like scripting Python within QGIS, but um, uh, so there's lots of options, <laughs> I guess. But this is kind of the path I usually follow if I'm trying to make a map for um, a report or a paper or poster or something like that. Um, so I've uh, on the left, I've loaded all the layers I want. Um, and each most of them, so I, I guess I'll start with the dot layer. And um, you'll notice that the dots are really, really small and they're hard to see on the map. But this is partly a function of how I want to print it out. Um, so I do have a layout view. Um, and I, I find sometimes working in GIS that the the screen view ends up looking like the the items feel a lot smaller than what ends up on the paper space layout. 
particularly if I'm making like a, a layout that's quite large. And I think this one it is set to about like 10 inches wide or so. Um, yeah, 10 inches by six inches. So it's enough to fit kind of on a landscape piece of paper. And also if I'm looking at a cross on a slide, for example, that fills the entire screen. Um, so that's why they look very small here, but if I made them the point size a lot bigger, it would look really busy and overlapping on the actual map. Um, and the colors I picked specifically to try to distinguish from each other, although I do find with dot maps, one of the challenges is picking colors that are, you know, it's actually kind of hard right now looking at this, but it's hard to really distinguish some of the colors. It looks better in the final product, but it's still not great. It's one of those things that I think going beyond like four colors on a dot map um, can be quite difficult. So it is one of those things for, I think it's very good for comparing between two to four categories um, or even just one category, like a univariate dot map can be quite useful as well to show densities. Um, but going beyond like five, six, seven different categories on one map can be quite difficult to parse at specific values. Um, yeah, and then the other layers in this map are just totally for reference. I added the land use layer in there. And this was kind of just a little trick on my end to like highlight the roads and rail lines in the background without actually adding a layer for roads and rail lines. Um, and that's because the land use layer doesn't actually include, have a polygon for roads and rail and transportation corridors and things like that. So just by coloring those as white, basically this entire layer is white. Um, it allows for kind of highlighting uh, built up area that's not kind of transportation. And you can kind of see in the background, it's might be a little bit hard to, it's probably easier to view when you're actually looking on your own, if you load this file on your own um, computer when looking at my screen, but you can kind of see the background highways, actually hydro corridors as well don't get mapped in this. So it adds this kind of background geographic reference. And I also wanted to have something where the dots, um, their background is white you know, as white as possible. And then anything else, reference layers would be a little bit gray. So I kind of added the land around the map to be gray and these to be gray as well, and kind of blatant in the background. So I'm really only placing dots on white and that gives the biggest contrast between the main variable of interest, which is where these dots are placed and, and a white background. And then the reference information is the most muted gray. Um, and same with the lake as well. It's kind of a little, it's blue, but it's very like a very muted blue. Um, And then the only other reference information are the major subway lines and um, kind of a very rough boundary for the city of Toronto. Although the boundary, I mean, arguably isn't really needed because if I don't include it, you can see kind of where the white stops and the gray starts, but I do kind of like having the little boundary in there anyway. Although it's, I don't think it's a, a necessary thing. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I really like the subtle colors that you're you're using, mm -hmm. but I often like have the concern that they won't be distinguishable either on a um, a computer screen that isn't exactly you know um, in the same <laughs> like each computer screen kind of views things differently. So I just I guess I um, I haven't explored using such subtle backgrounds. Um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on, um, you know, uh, creating these uh, backgrounds for a variety of different uh, viewers, or if you're primarily like thinking about this for print, where yeah. it's a little bit more controlled. I, yeah, I think it's a very good question. I think it's, yeah, it's totally dependent on what kind of the, where you think the map is going to be placed. I think it's something where, yeah, if it's for print, then I think, I agree. I would do it one way, but if I'm designing for a, you know, particularly on a screen or a web screen, put on a website, then I might give it a bit more contrast. I actually just did a, took a couple maps we did and put them on this like giant touch screen smart board thing. And the smart board like was very poor at picking out any sort of subtle colors. So it was like, and it was something I didn't even really think of. So it was, um, yeah, so it's often, I think, a challenge to like take something that's you design on one medium and moving it to another and um, and 
testing it and seeing if it works. And if it doesn't really do very well, like actually going back to the project file and just upping up the contrast, maybe for those background layers or something, um, and exporting a totally different map uh, if it really doesn't look great. So, um, yeah, thanks. I I, re I I really like it. I'm gonna try this a little bit more often and see if I can really make the main themes pop. Yeah, cool. Thank you. The backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I, I think I'll say, I'll say for reference on this kind of like the how I'm visualizing these layers, like sometimes for me, it's I'll show you that I'll take the exporter from QGIS at those set dimensions. And then similar to how I was showing an Inkscape before, I have an Inkscape file for this as well. Um, I'll export this entire map as a image. Um, and then bring it into Inkscape to see how it looks in that kind of paper space. Um, oh, sorry, it's on my, I have the two monitors going. It's not, it was showing up well. So this is the Inkscape file I realized without the um, map there. Let me just load that in. Um, Yeah, there we go. So, I, you know, this is similar to what I've done before. Um, I won't export right now because it might take a sec to export, but I, within kind of my layout view, I had set this up, save export as an image, wherever I wanted to save it um, as a, like a high resolution 300 DPI image. And then an Inkscape brought it in. Um, and I kind of zoom in and out to see like, okay, I know this is going to be 10 inches wide. I can put on a grid on the map actually, or, you know, this is a one inch grid and I kind of like zoom into approximately where my screen is approximately one inch of my view and see what it would look like if I'm kind of zoomed in that space or zoom in more if I think it's going to be, you know, shown online. You can kind of see now this, this map that I'm zooming into kind of this East end of Toronto and you can see the distribution of these different variables like a lot of rentals up here and more subsidized heads and down here and things like that. So it's kind of, um, I guess I didn't mean to get into that, but I often find like I'm visualizing data in GIS um, and then exporting it into kind of like a um, print layout like this to work on the layout items like the legend and things like that. Um, it's a lot of back and forth with like exporting the image and then re-importing it. Um, but one little, one nice thing in Inkscape is that you can have the base image that you, um, as linking to the file. So you don't constantly have to re-import it every time. Like if I re-export the map from QJS, Inkscape just like looks for that file. It's kind of like GIS looking for the data file rather than loading the data itself. So if the file updates, then it'll automatically update in Inkscape. So. But it is a lot of back and forth and kind of fine tuning, like the size of these dots, the thickness of these lines, um, kind of the subtle, like the background colors as well. Um, and I do find as well, like it's something, it's totally dependent on the screen I'm looking at. Like the two monitors I have show colors a little bit differently. So I'm often dragging the Inkscape for the QJS back and forth between the two monitors. And that's really just two monitors. Like, um, you know, totally different if you look on a phone as well. And I think there's <laughs> probably a whole like, uh, you know, tutorial you can do in designing maps to look good on mobile, which is incredibly difficult because of the small screen space. Um, but yeah, so I think on this one, I mean, I have, again, I have two, in this case, two layers. Um, one of them is just all the layout stuff. You can see I'm just selecting it all now. And this, again, was the case where I'm thinking, okay, I kind of want the title at the top of the map. Um, and then using this big empty space in Lake Ontario for my legend and information and all the other stuff that you may or may not want to include on your map. Um, yeah.
And then again, this is a, one of those cases where um, the legend itself is like a little mini chart. Um, and I've done this a few times, and I think it can be quite useful in this, this case, showing the overall distribution of these categories. And I would find creating a chart like this, I don't even know how I would really start doing this just solely within like the GIS layout options or within a more like a Python or R kind of toolbox. I'm sure it's possible, but I think uh, at least in Python R, you'd probably be writing a giant block of code to spit out something like this. Um, and like, personally, I just kind of go and draw it um, and like make sure I'm just drawing the size of these like in reference to the size of the proportions. Although I have done this before and made a mistake. So I guess there is that human error that can happen. But uh, um, so I guess that is kind of the risk in doing something by hand in, um, in Inkscape. So now I'm kind of like, I'm almost at the end here, but maybe I'll say one other thing about dot maps are, I think, useful, but they also have kind of downsides, downsides to them as well. And I wanted to kind of end with just zooming into kind of downtown Toronto or even this part on Humber Bay Shores, is that if there's lots of dots, like really high concentration in an area, they tend to overlap each other. And then it shows really high density, but it might be, it, not as even high as what it could be so you're kind of hiding a little bit of the data there as well um and like you could improve that by having you know fewer dots per person but then you know it's then some of the more suburban areas will be a little bit more sparse like it's difficult to depending on what your context is like really get like a rate of um observations per dot that works everywhere on the map um But I do like how this kind of map works at multiple scales. So like I can zoom into these different neighborhoods like Weston and see this like this really interesting now divide I've never seen before of like subsidized housing and rental apartments um, kind of halfway through the neighborhood. Um, but then you can also zoom out to look at the pattern as a whole across the city. Um, so I think I, there's only 14 minutes left, so I'll stop there. Um, but I'm happy to stick around if there's any questions and such. Um, and already you had a couple of things to add at the end. Yeah. Um, so let me see here. So yeah, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, just incredibly helpful. It's really nice to um, have a chance to talk about cartography, I think, and take a break from different um, applications of health geography and from the modeling and um, the methods, I suppose, for a second. Um, because I think communication is really important. And I think we're definitely moving into an era of science where there's gonna be more time for that um, in our practice. So we really appreciate you coming to chat with us. Um, so for all of you on the call, I just have a link to a short survey. There's seven questions. And if you're a student, there's a draw at the end for $100 cash. Um, well, not cash. It'll be a check from the U of T geography department. So if you have time to fill that out, I'm also going to email it to all of you. Um, and then, yeah, we have some time. If you have any questions for Jeff um, about this workshop or Jeff's research, um, education path, career path. You can pick Jeff's brain, nice, uh, rare opportunity. I will share, I had this like, last slide of some of my contact information and stuff we do at the School of Cities. Um, we often host like a lot of events generally around urban topics, but they're a big chunk of them are just, it's not just for U of T people. It's, they're totally publicly open to 
anybody in the community who wants to attend. So feel free to check out our stuff on any of these links. Um, there's a lot of links. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but um, I have like LinkedIn and Twitter. So feel free to connect me on there. But I honestly only check them like once or twice like a month. So <laughs> yeah. Um, Jeff, do you want to tell us actually quickly what your degrees were? Yeah, for sure. So my bachelor's was in civil engineering, and then I don't really do much of that at all. Um, and then I did a master's and PhD in geography. And I did more like, uh, as Ray mentioned at the beginning, like transit accessibility research in relation to demographics, a lot of like census related research. Um, but throughout that time, I always had kind of an interest in doing map making and cartography generally as kind of side work. And now the School of Cities, it's probably occupies like 50% of my time. And what's your role there with the School of Cities? Like, what does that, what's the other 50%? Um, some teaching. So hold, like, um, like uh, course instructing various things. Um, and then also holding like um, little workshops kind of like this. Um, and then also just kind of general data science GIS support for ongoing research that we're doing. So we have like students and postdocs who do more like traditional academic research, writing papers and such. So I'll support those kind of projects where possible. And then that's probably most of it. That feels like my nine to five-ish, <laughs> but yeah. Um, Marsha asked if anyone's using a newer Mac. And have you found design software that works well in them? Jeff, what do you think of Mac and GIS? <laughs> I mean, I don't actually, I use a Linux computer, so I don't know, but um, I know QGIS works on everything. So that's the always yeah. one I'll recommend. And then I, I think, think Inkscape does too. Yeah, it does as well. Um, it's yeah. not supported on the neural, on the M2. Oh, oh yeah. Apple is really, really yeah. shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I found like the most recent copy of QGIS won't work on my M2 and uh, neither I couldn't upload ink Inkscape either because hmm. they're saying that uh, OS 13 isn't supported right now. I didn't know they changed so much with it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I'm just curious if anyone is using that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Candice, go, go ahead. Thanks, Jeff, uh, for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I just very curious about like uh like uh, like U of T the city lab or general generally like the can can the the lab. <laughs> I'm not so familiar with the the whole name, but I know that you have kind of the dig data available, not only for spatial, but also for the census, like different kinds of data that can uh, access to. So I'm currently doing a research related to the transition to electric cars. So I wanted to uh, know about like the environmental awareness, like by provincial like level. Uh, so I just wondering that uh, for uh, what is like the main kind of, so is it like uh, for these two labs in U of T, uh, they provided some like data bases that we can access or have a look? So just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends exactly what kind of data, but Canoe hold like um, Ray and like Priya for sure, like feel free to jump in, like has uh, tons of available environmental data at like small geography level across Canada um, that I'm sure would be useful for um, I think what you're you want to do um, and then other kind of like there's there's a lot of you know census data on the population side and transportation network data that's um, available on a lot of other sources but yeah I would I would definitely recommend canoes stuff Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Because I feel that sometimes for census data is because the census is every five years. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to get a refined, like the data in between the, the five years. So maybe it is provide like the spatial level, but for kind of more like yearly, and uh, that will be a little bit tough. Yeah, thank you. There, so Candice, there are, um municipal census um 
it depends. So what, what specifically are you working on? Uh, so I try to understand what kind of factors influence uh, the electric car sales by province. So I find that the most difficult like factors is about environmental awareness or people's perception about the environmental stuff like by province. So that's why, yeah. I, I feel like you're, <laughs> you just have to collect primary data on something like yeah, that's so long. I don't think anyone's routinely collecting that unless you partnered with like a private sector company. There might be some public opinion polls out there and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Like, um, mm. yeah, it's like Ipsos, Reed. Yeah. And you could probably purchase their opinion. Although poll. there might be a specialized stats can kind of survey that asks me. Yeah. Stuff about like specific, like, you know, perceptions about the environment, but I don't know about specifically about electric I, cars. I feel like that's usually, yeah, that's like education on the environment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But again, that's going to be like a small sample survey that's like, you know, yeah. a survey of 5,000 people across all of Canada. So it's like to get there that is, length of geographic precision might be difficult. There is voter data, which oh. I think is really interesting. And then you can look at the platforms that the local um, candidates were elected on mm. so I wouldn't assume the environmental position of the candidates based on their party but instead their platforms are on their websites which you could scrape with some level of automation and um you can there's there's good voter data and you can see how many people voted for different candidates across the country wow. and that you could gleam some type of understanding of support for at least different people and their platforms i mean that's a bit of a weak link if they're supporting the environmental part of their platform but there's at least signals in different directions maybe at a national scale but if you want to drill down to like does an individual understand something i feel like you're like interviewing people yeah thanks a lot yeah, totally. for that yeah, yeah i actually don't uh uh, it's not so how to say very individual i just want to have a sense about how different province so maybe the vote data platform is a good start and is it like the municipal level or is it like a federal i would look at um i would look like look at all three elections oh. the mps the mpps municipal uh, data might be hard to get outside of big cities though because they might not have the resources to yeah, that's like the, true. the data should be public, but it's not like, you know, easily in a data. I mm -hmm. think the most helpful data is the MPPs because of the sheer numbers of them. There's so many of them. <laughs> um, yeah. Holly just sent something. Holly, can I forward Thank this? You. Yeah, go for it. KPMG, Canadians oh. Hot on Electric Vehicles. Um, yeah, Candace, I think lots of good advice. I think James said, or Marcia said, look at environmental NGOs. Um, but yeah, if I was working with you, I'd be looking to get funding to partner with an with a organization that, that has a lot of money to do. You could do some, you could at least do a few interviews and see what the how closely the um the large database um can be like connected to individual opinion and we're just like designing a PhD for Candace right now. Yeah, no. <laughs> I remember so reviewing a paper like a, this was like six years four or five six years ago but they, would, they did a specialized survey kind of on this topic and they were, they were interested in people's stated preference of like would you buy an electric car if it was this affordable relative like your environmental preferences and then if they actually did it so like the C oh. so um Totally forget exactly what the paper or anything was, but um, yeah, thanks a yeah. lot for for that because I feel that I currently have a better understanding about the canoe and all, uh, kind of the the a little bit like the research unit in U of T. So thanks a lot for the information. I will uh check check yeah, out. And, yeah, and and you know what, Candice, um, Doug Ford just paid for a factory to go up in St. Thomas to build batteries for electric cars. So I do think, I think we're going to see lots of grants for you. Uh, Marsha? 
Yeah, I was going to say like uh, some of the larger environmental organizations, I can't remember which one it was. It might be Clean Air Partnership. It might be um, the the Atmospheric Foundation. But one of them was was doing some like environmental data on like EV uptake. Um, but like I said, it would be like at the municipal level, maybe at the regional level, but especially when they're doing their their climate change plans. Um, like the municipalities are surveying people for those those kind of things for the actions that they plan to take. So if they're involved in like uh, um, the partnership for climate protection, they might have done that data. Yeah, like done those surveys at a municipal level, and then you can just combine a bunch of municipalities. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marcia. I'm gonna check you out. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Halton Region has that done as one and possibly Waterloo region as bigger regions in the. Yeah. I'm sure then the, I'm sure then the like Windsor, St. Thomas, London area will be doing that soon too. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Davia? Yeah, hi Jeff. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Uh, I learned a lot from it. Uh, I, have, I have a general question about the realization. So in terms of the publication, how, how important do you think the data visualization or creating maps uh, for the the public publication or the uh, reviewing process. How how much time researchers should spend on? Yeah, I don't. It's a good general question. I mean, um, yeah. My feeling is that like after you know, I probably reviewed like 70, 80 papers, and I I treat um you know the quality of i'm biased but i treat the quality of graphics as very similarly to the quality of writing so if something isn't written very well it becomes more difficult to parse out what the research is actually trying to do and say and what the results are and the same thing goes with any graphics that are included in that publication like if it, the graphic isn't poorly presented whether it be a map or anything else it makes it hard to communicate that research so it's like i think it's something where i don't know i can't put like a ballpark in exactly how much time but I would put in at least as much time as what you're doing and try to make in terms of the quality of the writing of your paper. Um. Mm -hmm, thank you. And um, another question in terms of the bivariate uh, mapping. So, so you may know I use the more I statistics to evaluate the uh, spatial correlation between two variables. And mm -hmm. you suggest that I could just use the the bivariate mapping you just show in this workshop. Um, so this this map looks fancier than the um, more size but this just a visualization and it doesn't provide any statistical significance. So how how do you think of it? Yeah, so I think you know these map like a bivariate map like I showed or even just a univariate choropleth map they're you know they're very good for exploratory um kind of purposes or kind of just showing general findings of patterns across space or how two variables relate to each other but yeah they don't have like a statistical significance directly related to them and like doing some sort of bivariate morans eye would kind of parse out those areas but it is Doing kind of like a you know a local hotspot or more anti kind of thing like that. Um, that's also reliant on whatever the spatial weights matrix is, and so it um, it's partly not just you're not just showing what like a specific value is, which is what the bivariate maps are showing. It's like it's that related to the ones that it's neighboring, however the neighboring is defined. So it's a bit of a different purpose um, in that sense. Um, I don't know if that directly answers your question and like it's not like a one or the other kind of thing it's like I would go the second approach if you were really interested in getting finding general patterns of you know hot spots or cold spots or high low correlations between something but if it, the goal is more just kind of like more generally looking at the patterns across space and looking and being able to like zoom in and out and look at specific neighborhoods um I think a more general simpler approach is often better um Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the the dot map, uh, I, I think it it focusing on the density, so it doesn't reveal much information about proportion. Uh, well, the bivariate is 
it could show the um the proportion information. So is there a third method that could show both of the density and proportion? Well, the dot map does show proportion, but not like it doesn't give you an exact value. Like it shows kind of a relative proportion of something. So like it kind of at the end, I was zooming into an area. We could see like, okay, but just with your kind of eye, you can see there's a lot more red dots than there are orange dots, for example. And that gives you like a kind of a rough approximation of a, a proportion. But obviously it doesn't tell you the exact like, you know, there's you know, 10% versus 20% or something like that. So like the more, I guess, accurate way in that sense to do it is actually just like do a core pleth map and look at the specific value if you really are interested in the specific value. But the yeah, the dot maps I find are able to do both density and proportion at a very, both at kind of a general sense um, across an entire region or kind of zooming into a specific region. Um, but so they're good if you want to know kind of overall patterns like that, but not if you want to know the exact value within a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. okay. Great, thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions for Jeff? All right. Um, well, thanks so much, Jeff. We appreciate your time. And I think everyone's definitely uh, more inspired to improve their cartography. I definitely am. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye.